Welcome to Superhero Century, part of the Cinema Composite channel. This is the podcast where we break down every superhero movie this side of the year 2000. This is episode three, Blade 2. I'm your host, Dan, and I'm joined by... Tom. Matt. And Kat. All here once again. Blade 2, you guys. Are you as excited about this as I am? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Check. We got that. Okay. <laughs> one yes. Well, so if you're new to the podcast, we watch one of these movies at a time. We dissect it, break it down in a fun way. You know, we just give our basic thoughts. We have some categories. So we started this podcast with the year 2000, just as kind of an arbitrary date to start it off. But unfortunately, that means we missed Blade 1, which came out in 1998. Do you guys just want to do a quick rundown of your thoughts of Blade 1 before we get into Blade 2? I love Blade 1. It's a small cult of people that love the Blade, the first Blade film, but it's a wonderful cult. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. Its biggest flaws is, you know, just technology was not ready for a, a blood demon to be fully formed on screen. But God, it's a lot of fun. It's really hard not to enjoy the first Blade movie. I mean, some motherfuckers always trying to ice skate uphill is an iconic line. That is definitely the best part of the movie. I See, I didn't watch Blade until a few years ago, and like, I'm glad it exists. I'm glad that it happened and paved the way, but also it's not a good movie. It's not good. I don't know. I really like it. I think yesterday we wanted to watch Blade 1 before watching Blade 2 just because we're like, oh, let's just put it on. And once we put it on, we're like, are we going to sit through this? And sure enough, like five minutes in, I'm like, this is the best. I love this. I could watch this all day. <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. I do think it's important to point out that I am the only one here who has not rewatched it in the past couple days. That's fair. I, I think I had never seen it before. I was a newbie to both these movies, but I loved it. As a B action movie, it just works. You know, I love to watch it again in the theater at midnight just because it's so fun. The action is actually really good despite some of the bad CGI. That opening scene in the club, I think, is really good. Kicks off the whole movie. I'm somehow like really shocked by this, but I love it for <laughs> me. <laughs> I, I love that you love it. I was not expecting you to enjoy it, Dan. I, I do feel like I should walk back my statements a little bit. It's not a good movie. It's not a bad time, though. It's a fun time. It's a, <laughs> a moderately fun time. It's very indicative of its time. Well, you could say it's a bad movie because of a lot of different reasons. You know, Stephen Dorff's acting is pretty terrible, and we said the CGI is bad, but it's easy to see the influence it had on not only superhero movies, which we'll talk about a little bit, but just like costumes in general in movies, uh, tone in movies. You know, having an action superhero movie that's rated R, I don't think you get things like Logan and even like Deadpool without having an R-rated superhero movie that does really well. I think you can also see the influence in a movie like John Wick, just like a deadly assassin going through these underworld places. Like that reminded me exactly of John Wick watching Blade 1. I wonder if you're giving Blade a little too much credit, though, because a lot of the aesthetic of Blade was pretty common in the 90s. And then The Matrix came out the year after. And I think most of those things are probably taken more from The Matrix. And then to to also say that, like, Stuff like Logan and Deadpool are, are, you know, like this paved the way for them. I don't know that it did because we went a long period of time before we got those, you know, a long period of time in of superhero movies that are geared toward a younger crowd before we got to something like Deadpool or Logan. And I think that is just a natural progression of wanting to tell mature stories. So I, I, I think you're giving Blade too much credit. I will come to I your mean, defense, Dan, and say that it is the first R-rated comic movie that like doesn't pull any punches. I mean, they go for it 100%, and you don't see that again until much later. I mean, they did, no one wanted to do a comic movie that was rated R, not based off like a Marvel comic, let alone. So like, I think it's ahead of its time in some ways, but also very much hurt by its time. Maybe someday when we finish this series, we can go back and review some of the pre-2000 superhero movies, and we can do like a more deep dive on Blade. But we're on to Blade 2. Let's get some context of Blade 2. Directed by Guillermo del Toro, one of our favorite modern directors. Uh, this was his fourth movie, I want to say. Is that right, Tom? Maybe you are the resident expert. On... I, think he, I think he did Kronos, Mimic, and Devil's Backbone. Yeah, it's actually, it's really interesting to see something like the Devil's Backbone immediately followed by this is crazy. And then next we have, for, for he did Hellboy, and then immediately after that, Pan's Labyrinth. So it's really interesting to see those next to each other on his filmography. And he was pretty young when he did this. I think he was like early 30s, I want to say. This was definitely, it felt more like a paycheck to him, or like just something to put on his like film credits. I don't know though, because this is definitely more of a young, upcoming director getting his first chance at a bigger movie. I mainly say that because, as Tom is probably looking like he wants to say, that he didn't have any writing credit. And like usually he's, he's pretty there with the story. Like if he's writing it, he knows how it's going to look. I feel like he was a little out of his element because it's like, here's the story, 
try to make it look good. We'll talk more about that in a bit, but okay. I don't think that it's accurate to say that this was just a, a paycheck for him because he, I think, cares deeply. I mean, he's a very well-versed nerd, and so a lot of the things that he puts into this come out of his just love of the genre and wanting to make it a rich world. And, and he, just because he, you know, he didn't write the script doesn't mean that he didn't fill it with as much love as he could. Because, I mean, that's truly the type of person where he, it's his love of things that makes him work so hard at him. So I, I think that he was probably jumping to do something like this because it was a world he wanted to break into. You have made me feel bad for saying that now <laughs> I concede. And knowing him, you know he's always wanted to make like a Dracula type movie and this is kind of the his chance to try could. to do something like that. Some other facts written by David S. Goyer who wrote the first one. He ended up writing the third one as well and he also did the entire Dark Knight trilogy with Christopher Nolan. Hmm. It debuted March 22nd, 2002. A couple interesting facts about that is our last podcast was Unbreakable in 2000 which means... There was no superhero movie in 2001, which is crazy to think about knowing our current landscape. Um, the other weird thing is, is this came out in March and it's different now where movies come out in you know all months of the year. But at the time, any kind of blockbuster action movie coming out in March was kind of like a death sentence. Essentially, no one went to the movies at that time, but it still did pretty well. It made $155 million worldwide on a budget of $54 million. Somehow, this cost $25 million less than Unbreakable. I don't understand the math at all. It's the Starbucks, I tell you. <laughs> well, maybe even just the star power? Yeah, that's definitely part of it, but... Wesley Snipe works a lot cheaper than both of those people. <laughs> and we watched this. I mean, the CGI budget couldn't have been that high. <laughs> uh, I mean, at like the it time. it wasn't, it wasn't. Yeah. But even just like the creature design had to be worth more than any shot in Unbreakable. I will say this is nice. It has more practical effects thanks to, I, I feel like Guillermo del Toro had a hand in that probably because he likes to get his hands dirty. Like this was much gooier than the last one. There's a lot of grosser Stuff. Oh, he he loves that. He loves getting into just the visceral, like, body horror stuff. There are a few good moments we can talk about later, but just the getting into an actual prosthetic and, and peeling it open. and just It's a good time. You could tell he was pleased with that. Ew. Uh, I should mention that Stephen Norrington directed the first one and was offered to direct this one, but turned it down. What are you doing instead? You know, I'm not sure if he did anything right around this time, but he did do League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, which came out a year later. Ah, uh, so. and we all know how that went. What are you talking about? You love that movie. Well... <laughs> I do love that movie, Dan. However, I'm I'm realistic in knowing that it ended a lot of careers, a.k.a. Sean Connery just stopped doing movies. Let's go to personal reactions of Blade 2, watching this today. Um, tell me what you think of the movie, maybe before you saw it before this, and then watching it again today. What do you think about Blade 2 as a movie? I feel like rewatching the first one, I enjoyed it. I enjoy it more and more every time. This one, like rewatching Blade 2, I was just kind of like, okay. I, I mean, like, there's so much carnage and everything, which is great and fine whatever but the story itself I'm like I could take it or leave it I had remembered liking it a lot more this time was sad because I felt as the movie went on I was just like the plot is really kind of shitty there's a lot of cool stuff to look at and there's a lot of nice changes from the first film but overall the plot just doesn't do anything for me I feel the same way now as I did the first time I watched it and that it's it's not a good movie but you see a lot of del Toro's genius coming through especially with just his creature design and his love of of the kind of grotesque for a little context Pan's Labyrinth is my favorite movie and uh, uh, you can just see how much love he has for this type of stuff. Yeah, I would say this was my first time watching this. And I was excited for that. And the visual style doesn't disappoint. There's tons of great costume design, creature design, all of that. And you can tell he's definitely leaning more into the classic vampire aesthetic versus like the, the first Blade was more about like these kind of punk kids in yeah. New York with the techno music and all this. This Grungy. is definitely... You know, set in Eastern Europe, the vampires look like Nosferatu. You know, it's like he's definitely trying to go more of a classic look there. And I, I really appreciated that. But the movie itself, pacing wise, I just feel like it just doesn't work. I think the whole middle section where they bring in the new, the blood pact or whatever they're called. Right. Is it the pack or the pact? I'm not sure. Blood pack. The blood pact. They bring them in. They have all these new characters. You're kind of excited at first and then you realize you don't care about any of them. They're they, essentially a suicide squad. It is. Basically. Yeah. But in doing that, they kind of push Blade, the character, to the side a little bit. And that's the best. The best part about that first movie, I think, is... Wesley Snipes as Blade. Like, just, he just, like, commands that role. And this movie just gets bogged down in the middle. There's a whole action sequence in the middle when they're in that Prague club that just, like, it feels like it goes for 45 minutes. And, like, I don't really care much about what's going on. Just as a movie, I don't think it works very well. As a visual experience, great. Again, this is the only movie that Del Toro's done where he doesn't have a writing credit. And he's not always he's not always the best writer. He's not the most subtle writer. But I do think that he has an understanding of character 
that would have been really beneficial here because he would have he would have given it some real stakes. <laughs> stakes. Wow. Yep. I unintentional. Love that. Unintentional, but great. So I, I do think that something that would have ended up very differently if he had been allowed to take a, a stab at that script. A stab. You were full of the uh, I like even if you weren't trying, I think you did a great job on that, Tom. Great job. <laughs> Something I noticed that was a little different between Blade 1 and Blade 2 was Blade 1 had that more punky type vibe. And I feel like there was a weird amount of like sex because it was like a rated R. Mm -hmm. But in this movie, Blade 2, it was more about drugs. There was a lot more drugs, either blood cocaine, which shows up for like a <laughs> scene. And uh, I think I forget Scud offers Blade like a joint. And instead of saying no, he says later. So I'm like, that's pretty hip for a superhero movie. Sure. <laughs> Just a dumb thing I noticed. Can you say blood cocaine like Michael Caine? Blood cocaine. Nice. <laughs> Okay, let's move on to some categories. Uh, this is where we kind of break down the movie with a couple fun little ways. Let's start with some trivia. These are just things I found on the internet. They might be true, might be not. Del Toro wanted the film to blend comic book styles with Japanese animation. I don't know. I guess I do like the samurai sword battles we do get. There are some good mm -hmm. sword fighting in this. Probably more sword fighting than in the first one. Uh, it was filmed mostly in Prague and a few places in London in 2001. It was a box office success, especially when you consider the March release date. There are a ton of references to other comic book characters hidden in the background. Uh, one is a shirt that uh, references Hellboy. I think there is also a poster of Doctor Strange somewhere in the background. I did not see that. <laughs> I think I read that it was one of the stained glass windows yeah. in the church sequence. And I read something about how Guillermo del Toro, he expressed interest in doing a Doctor Strange movie at one point. And I'm like... Oh my god! I yeah. want to see that <laughs> with, with Neil Gaiman as the writer, which would have been would have been incredible. Awesome. This is just something I found researching Del Toro. Nothing to do with Blade Two necessarily, but I did not know this. You guys might have already. But Del Toro's dad was kidnapped in 1997, and he. By vampires? Well, no, someone in Mexico, and he needed ransom money, and James Cameron withdrew over one million dollars in cash from his bank and used it as the ransom money. Wow, that sounds like a movie. Yeah. Why hasn't that been made into a movie? Any other trivia that you guys found? Apparently on the commentary, which I have not watched and probably never will because I don't want to put it in time, but uh, I think Del Toro kind of shits on Goyer's script a little bit and um, and some of the bad CGI. So I think he was aware of its flaws. Also, apparently about over 30 of the cast members were temporarily blinded by incorrect use of the of the lights during the autopsy scene. So that's fun. That's I don't amazing. Know, I don't know how long, maybe like 30 <laughs> seconds, maybe like a day. I don't know. I read something about how, and I don't know, obviously, like he said, if this is true or not, but I read that Michael Jackson was supposed to make a cameo yep. <laughs> um, in the House of Pain scene as a vampire pimp. And that would have wow. added a whole new level of what? <laughs> they would have needed no makeup or CGI. <laughs> it would have been great. Apparently they did have a Polish actor film that scene and then they got the scenes got cut anyway. Aww. And then my last thing is just talking a little bit about the design for the Reaper's uh, mouths, which uh, is very similar to the design for the strain. But apparently he had come up with that design for the strain prior to actually being hired for this movie and then kind of borrowed from his own idea. But the idea of the um like the tongue or like stinger coming out is based off um like polish vampire folklore interesting next category is casting decisions i couldn't really find anything about this if there were other people potentially cast it's hard with a sequel because obviously you're going to bring back wesley snipes and bring back chris christopherson was a you know that was a choice because he was basically dead in the, in the first one i think it was a poor choice i hate I, how he's I, tacked I, on I, I love chris christopherson ah. in this love him but like it's just weird how they brought the him character back. is weird but i like the actor a lot so many one-liners yeah, it definitely seems like they didn't plan to bring him back and like, oh shit, we have to make another one? Ooh. But I, the only, the like Perlman's great. The only issue I have, and it's not even an issue, is Norman Reedus because he's simultaneously the best and the worst. Because like, it's such a bad character. It's, it's not good acting, but also... It's probably one of my favorite parts of the movie is just how dumb he is. He does nothing for me. I hate the name Scud. I hate the whole character. It, during this part, we should talk about how much this movie or this franchise means to Wesley Snipes. Like Wesley Snipes. He is Blade. He thinks he's Blade. He believes deep down he's Blade. And he, he brings a lot of input to this. And I, I think a lot of the character decisions are his. Well, that goes back to what you said, Dan. It's a shame that he's not in it more. We spend too much time with the blood pack and there are some brief moments where he seems a little old and like in his movement, but in others, like he's a complete badass. Well, he doesn't, he doesn't have a character arc in this, I don't think. He doesn't do anything. No. He's, other than some fighting. He's there just to carry out the plot, but like the first one had like, he's trying not to turn into a vampire. He's struggling with the, having the, what do you call it? The taste or the, yes, the thirst. The thirst. Not the taste. He's struggling with the thirst and he has the relationship with with the the woman in the first one 
he kind of has a romantic thing with Nisa and this, but it's yeah. so small That's and like, generous. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to best scene. Um, what was your best scene? I've got a couple of nominees. They're pretty much all just fight scenes. The in between stuff is kind of whatever. Right. Um, I've got nominees are the first scene where he's rescuing Whistler from wherever he's being held. I've got the ninja fight scene in the warehouse. I really like that one because it's got the, the really cool lighting. It's got like, the side panel lighting that's kind of shining on there. Sure. Um, the Prague club fight scene, which goes on so long. I got the sewer fight when they're down the sewers. And then the final fight. I guess one of the nominee could be when they open the, the guy up and see the the dissection. That yes, could, that's a good that point. That might be in there too. Any other nominees? I also had the kind of the ninja sword fight but that one is really harmed by some bad CGI yes, that just didn't I was age well. Say, it's crippled um, by that. But I actually, I actually think that my my two favorite scenes are not fight scenes. It's Perlman, uh, Reinhardt, and Blade's first meeting when Blade does like the and then just slaps him <laughs> twice. And that was a really good sound effect. Th- thank that you. That was really good. Um, and then does the now there's an explosive device on the back of your head, and it's like that's such a stupid line, and it's so good. But just, that's like the best part about the Blade movies. I yeah, think, right. Just like those stupid <laughs> one-liners. Wesley Snipes can deliver those those oh, dumb man. lines. Like I, I, it's something I was going to talk about later, but yeah. like it just makes me wonder if like how much of it is intentional and like scripted, and how much of it is just Wesley Snipes like right. channeling his inner Blade. <laughs> Yeah. I think my favorite scene is like the whole blood pool scene, like from him emerging from it, like the, throughout the, the, the whole Wonka fight. pool of blood. Yes, Correct. throughout the whole fight, like every moment of it, like from slicing Ron Perlman in half to like the sunglasses, like being <laughs> flicked into toss. his hand, like everything from start to finish, like that is a great example of what I love about Blade. That's exactly what I had written down on to a T. The only other one that I I thought of was just the scud betrayal uh not because the betrayal is particularly good or anything like that but his death sequence is just so over the top and hilarious to me oh that's so bad like i just <laughs> it's just oh and it just turns into dust i'm gonna go with the actual the, the dissection of the the reaper when they actually get to see inside the mouth like that's just such good like creature work from del toro like that is the stuff i'll remember from this movie yeah i'll back you on that one I'm glad that those um, 30 plus people could be um, temporarily blinded for your enjoyment, Dan. <laughs> I th- I think it was worth it. In one of the it. weird Hollywood moments, I think it was worth it. <laughs> Took a lot of heat. Glad they did it. That that might be the most impressive scene. I would say I know. It, that that it is the most. Me, it reminds me of Alien, the original, when they're dissecting the the person with the alien. I would say that's the most del Toro scene of the film. Would you agree, Tom? You are the yeah, again, you, he you see the love of the actual prosthetic and stuff like that. Um, but just the rib cage and like yeah, explaining like, yeah, that. Yeah, just, just the body horror of it. It made you think of Alien, but it made me think of The Thing. And I that's that thing. I think that would make Del Toro very happy to hear both of those. <laughs> I think the the first moment I actually like realized it was like his movie, because like his he has a very definite style, is when the ninjas show up. Because their masks, to me, is like the most... like Anything before that, I think you could make an argument that it was another director. Because there's not... It was very Blade-esque. We're in a tunnel. We're in... You know, they're drawing blood, but not until that specific moment it has a very similar vibe to uh some of the hellboy moments right right all right let's move on to villain corner where we analyze the villain's plan whether it was you know logical whether it made sense whether they maybe had a point so there's kind of a couple villains there's like the main reaper nomak i want to say he's the villain for most of the movie that they're going after but then you realize later it's really down the skinos the more nosferatu looking vampire lord guy you realize that his daughter is nisa and he sent nisa on this mission and he realized also that he created nomak to i don't know (laughs) it's weird all along and i honestly had more mental love for this movie because i thought the main vampire bad guy. What was his name again? I'm sorry. Damaskinos. I thought that was actually, I don't know why I thought this was Dracula, which would have made a lot more sense to me because it's like, he is like the king of the vampires because he's more Nosferatu. Uh, it's essentially the same though. Yeah, it's just a but. shame because like that was, I'll get into that later, but it's just so a bummer. I'm going to use the confusion here trying to explain who the villains are as my reasoning for why it's not a good plan because right. you don't really know why they're doing what they're doing. You know, eventually he reveals that he wanted to get laid so he can get that Daywalker blood to to create his super vampires. But what a terrible if he had way. An, if he had an inside man already, why go through the whole thing? Like right. get 
uh, Scud to help break in, take Blade under, don't arm him and tell him how to defeat these things, and then you can make your super vampires and send him the blood pack later. Yeah, there's like some talk about pure blood versus non-pure blood. I, I just didn't really get it. So it's a bad plan. Of the movies that we've watched, it's the worst plan so far. I will say that Nomax motivation is decent. It's a the Frankenstein, you know, creator type relationship. He at least has something interesting going for him, but it's it's not a lot. It's pretty thin. All right, next category is capes and tights, where we rate the superhero costumes in this. You know, there's obviously the very classic Blade costume from the first movie. You didn't have to do much for this one. How would you rate the other costumes in this movie? I mean, you've got the Assassin's costume that we mentioned, which it's a great intro, but the CGI really does hurt it in some parts. I do think Blade's outfit changed a smidge, though. I feel like his buckles were different. Rewatching it this time, I kept trying to see, like, is it the head of something? It's just a weird design. I thought it was, like, something, actually. I just really, the whole 90s leather daddy aesthetic is not my thing. Uh, it's the same thing when I rewatched The Matrix. I was like, okay, I love this movie, but we can get past the weird tight leather I mean, the the way that they did, I hated the black stormtrooper like from Star Wars. Like that didn't make any sense because they weren't really protected from the light in any way. If anything, they should have had the assassin's garb like mm-hmm. to at least cover their face, but nobody did. We also have the great chainmail shirt from that one guy. That oh, yeah, is wonderful. Yes. Um, I'll also mention Ron Perlman's beard. It's a choice. You know, that's probably a costume <laughs> choice. It's not just the beard. It's that the beard goes into a okay. single strip on the back of his head. The strap. I don't hate Wesley Snipes' blade costume i'm like looking at the poster right now i'm like i kind of dig it like, I mean, it's just like it's so fitting for the character i guess that it's just like i, I want to make sure that i'm not saying anything's bad about blade's costume there's more leather for the other characters and the first one than this one this one was a little less leather but if i have to watch leather on a person i'm glad it's wesley snipes <laughs> Next category is which side character deserved their own spinoff? Give that Scud spinoff, am I right? Uh, Hard yuck. (laughs) Uh, Yuck. The obvious choice here is Snowman, Donnie Yen. He is the one I wanted so much more of. He didn't use the sword as much as I thought he would. That's why we need the spinoff. It wasn't, did he do all the fight choreography for this? Uh, So he didn't do all of it, but he did some of it. For me, the best answer for a spinoff, I would actually do a prequel of uh, Whistler and his whole life, his origin story of how he became like a grizzled vampire hunter until the point he finds Blade, like it would end right when he finds Blade. Who do you cast as young Christopherson? Uh, Well, it wouldn't work so much now, but I probably would have done... Jeff Bridges. Correct, Jeff Bridges. Thank you. It makes sense. It has to be Jeff Bridges. Yeah, but then why wouldn't you just cast young Chris Christopherson? I think think it'd be funnier, though. That would be the joke, is that they're the same. I was going to say Wyatt Russell. Oh, yeah. Very solid. I do love Wyatt Russell. Wyatt not. Okay, next category is the producer's chair. If you could go back and change one thing about the movie, what would it be? I feel like this is a very big thing to change, but I just think like we talked about the whole like villain for the movie. It would have been nice if they just kind of like centered on one and had it more, I don't know, just better. <laughs> I don't know. I wish it had been Dracula and it was just that main head Dracula, the Lord of Vampires, kind of being like, we have to stop Blade. It would make sense because Blade's first appearance was in a Dracula comic. So it would have been nice to go back to that. I think Guillermo del Toro would have liked that more too, getting to handle and play with the real Dracula and seeing how he fits in that universe as opposed to the henchmen then all that jazz yeah my change would be just to like either cut out the blood pack or cut it in half you know like there are some characters in there where you kind of get to know them a little bit but for the most part like there's a scene where the red-headed girl kind of like sacrifices herself by opening the sunlight or whatever and you're supposed to feel bad for that sacrifice but I'm like I don't think she has she said anything at this point like do we we like her right (laughs) My big thing is just let Del Toro do another treatment of the script. I, I think we would have been given something that was still probably like trashy fun, but better, more tight. All right, let's go to questions. What questions does this movie raise? What questions do you want answered? Did Stephanie Meyer take her concept of the old vampires from Twilight from this movie? That's my question. I love that. <laughs> the, the look of disinterest on Matt's face when Twilight <laughs> got brought up. It, I've only seen really the movie one time. But it really can't be conveyed it. in words, but I, I do question question in this movie light and uh whistler like if you're bringing him back and saying he lived because he's a vampire he should be affected by these light grenades that he's inventing there's like a lot of weird things that you could question that i'd never noticed until this viewing and so i was again let down yeah that was my whole question is like what is whistler is he (laughs) a vampire is he not he's not a daywalker because he's not yeah it wasn't created the same way blade was i don't 
I don't get him. I like him, but I don't get him. Yeah, that like serum that Blade gives him when he recovers him is essentially our that's our quantum. You know, it's Basically. just like we're gonna say this <laughs> thing and it doesn't make any sense, but just go with it. Which I also think is funny. Speaking of like just it's just this thing. They explain that punching tool that Scud makes Blade. It's basically the chemical from Blade One, but they just lightly go over it as if you know, Blade's never heard of this. I'm like, it's literally the thing you used to beat the bad guy in the last movie. Also, another question, not that I really cared about her, but what happened to Karen from the first one? They had a nice little relationship going. I really didn't like her that much. <laughs> I thought her delivery was terrible, yeah. and I'm glad we didn't have to see her again. But I was just kind of wondering, like, there's no mention of her anywhere. You okay, girl? Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to think she started a podcast about vampires, and no one believes her, and she's just a crazy person. Yeah. All right, let's go to the cringe factor. What aged the worst and what doesn't look good anymore? What didn't age the worst? I would say probably the CGI, as we mentioned, really puts a damper on that opening sword fight. I think you could easily make a good case for the first Blade movie being it uses the video game sort of effects better than this one. Like some of the fight choreography in the final fight with Blade is horrendous to yeah, watch. Yeah, th- th- that that really really bugged me. Is the CGI wrestling match between Oof. the two is just like and there was that no looks need. So bad. I said. So I guess the biggest flaw with this movie is just probably the passage of time. I mean, yeah, time and script. Sure, but like I think we would lo- overlook those kinds of things if the movie was good. If the story was good, we wouldn't care about that kind of stuff. But Fair. the fact that we don't care, we have to we nitpick that kind of stuff. All right, let's move on to Legacy. Will this movie live on for future generations, and is it a success? No and no. (laughs) Well, I don't know. I mean, I'll be interested to see if this gets... So we talked about in our Unbreakable podcast how that when Split and Glass came out that it probably made people rewatch Unbreakable. I'm curious if when they do the Blade adaptation with Mahershala Ali, if people will revisit this series. And I'm so here... like. Originally, I would think, okay, I love Wesley Snipes' Blade. He is Blade. His voice, like his presence in in the movies, it's just so spot on. But the second they announced casting of Mahershala, I was like, this is the best thing that's ever happened. So I feel like the legacy will live on in that way. Like people are going to be curious of what came before. I guess uh, the legacy is is more assigned to Blade, the first Blade. This one adds the Reapers, which like that's a pretty iconic design but other than that like there's nothing about this one in particular that i think is going to stand out until they make the third one (laughs) well yeah so there's the third blade movie that's a whole other basket of trouble the thing for the legacy for me it's basically to be the thing if you're a del toro fan you're going to go see it and if you're going to see it like most people want to finish that filmography for him he doesn't have too many films so why not throw that one in the mix but if you're gonna watch it you're gonna watch the first blade and that's a good gateway drug and then you're gonna be very let down by blade 2 unfortunately i think it'll just be known as the artsier blade film maybe maybe not the better one but the better visual visual blade movie yeah i could see down the road if del toro makes a few more you know masterpieces and you know in 30 years i could see people writing essays about blade 2 and how it really captured his early vision and all this you know like some of that i think as long as del toro is relevant as a director this movie will have some kind of life well folks the sun is coming up as blade says catch you later (laughs) did he say that i don't know he did we're gonna wrap it up there though um blade 2 it's okay next time you guys maybe the reason why i wanted to start this podcast is next time i am so excited for 2002 directed by sam raimi spider-man (laughs) <laughs> well, it's not even that. It's more that this is all started for Spider-Man 2. Let's really? not. Yeah, it's no. the gateway for you. Spider-Man 2 is just such an underrated masterpiece. Oh, okay. But Spider-Man 1 is a Let's lot of fun. Let's just slowly fade out from there. Yes. All right. <laughs> Thanks for listening. We've all seen Spider-Man, the original, I'm assuming, right? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. It's be, been a long time. It'll though. be a fun rewatch. We will see you next time. Yeah.